Hello, my name is Mark Gibson, and you're listening to the podcast version of the Chagask Signpost series, a weekly webinar that promotes and examines sustainability in Irish farming. So a very good morning to you. You're very welcome to this morning's Signpost webinar. Um, my name is Mark Gibson, a program manager of the Chagas Connected program, and we're joined by Pat Murphy, who is the head of the Chagas Knowledge Transfer Program on Environment. Uh, this series is brought to you by Chagas in collaboration with Dairy Sustainability Ireland. And uh, today we're going to be, I'm, I'm sorry, the National Rural Network and Food Drink Ireland Skillnet. And today we're going to be discussing uh, the freshwater pearl mussel. And uh, the per freshwater pearl mussel has been classified as one of 365 most endangered species on earth by the International Union for Conservation of Nature. So in response to that, uh, this status, a relative new project has been established to recognize farmers uh, financially and to re re recognize uh, the environmental efforts that they've been making. Uh, so we're delighted to be joined by Dr. Patrick Crushell, who is a chartered ecologist and is project manager of the Freshwater Pearl Mussel Project, EIP. Patrick, good morning to you. Morning, Mark. Thanks for inviting me along. You're very welcome to the Science Post webinar. It's really good to have you and uh, to share the, the really excellent work that you're doing. The, the Freshwater Pearl Mussel Project, it, it's working across a number of different catchments, Patrick. Is that right? Uh, that's right, Mark. We're working in eight catchments across the western seaboard from um, the north of Donegal, from Glen Bay, down as far as uh, southwest Cork, down near Beira Peninsula. So we have eight catchments. They're very similar in characteristics, same types of farming, same type of landscape. So it's, it's, um, yeah, it's an exciting project. They're, they're the most important catchments, I suppose, for these pearl mussels. They, they still sustain a, a recruiting population, which I, I can go into in a bit more detail later. I understand there's there's populations in Russia, but Ireland is probably one of the the, the, the largest populations across Europe. Is that right? Yeah, here in Scandinavia, probably Ireland has uh, one of the strongest in Western Europe. Uh, they've gone extinct from large areas of Western Europe in Ireland and within Ireland itself. I suppose the Western Seaboard. It's those catchments that haven't been haven't suffered as much land use change and pressures over the years that still sustain the conditions necessary for, th for this species. So um, that's why we're concentrating on those ones, like some of the Eastern catchments in Ireland would still sustain adult mussels, but they're on their way out. There's no juveniles being recruited. So they're really just a, a almost extinct population just waiting to go. Why, why is it so important that we try to protect this species, Patrick? Well, the, the species itself, it's a, it's a real key indicator of uh, ecological quality. So if, if there was any issues within the rivers and the surrounding landscape, this would be the first indicator to show that there's a problem or that something something's going wrong. So it, it's a real indicator of ecosystem health. I mean, the species itself, it's, it's, it's an extraordinary uh, creature in the, the it's, it's life cycle and that, and it's a, uh, it's an ancient species and it just adds to biodiversity to keep that there and the functioning of these rivers, it, it contributes to that. It, it provides a lot of functions in relation to water quality and, and even cleans the, the, the water itself through its filter, filtering process and that. So yeah, it, it is a key species to, that we should be trying to conserve and, and maintain. So Patrick, uh, we'll hand over to you and uh, we'll chat to you afterwards. Great, thanks Mark. Um, so yeah, thanks. I, I'm here, as I said, to present the Pearl Mussel Project. It's a European innovation partnership. Uh, we've been set up to trial and maybe and design and uh, implement a results-based payment scheme targeting endangered species and while delivering also for wider environmental benefits. So I suppose what sets us apart from some of the other results-based schemes out there is that we're, we're attempting to our target in this is, is water quality and uh, an aquatic species. So that, that's the main challenge and, and what sets us apart from some of the other results-based programs out there that are mainly focusing on terrestrial habitats and species. Um, so we're working in, as I mentioned a minute ago, we're working in the top eight catchments in Ireland. They uh, support 35% of the European freshwater pearl mussel population. Uh, the funding for the program is through the from the Department of Agriculture and Marine, and it's uh, under Rural Development Program 2014 to 2020. So we're a European Innovation Partnership. We're uh, one of the larger EIPs in the country with a total budget of 10 million. Uh, it's a five-year project. Um, the whole idea is that the results-based approach is we're we're locally adapting the the scheme to the areas we're working in, the landscape, and to the types of farming and stuff in these catchments. 
Uh, the key story stakeholders, obviously the farmers themselves we're engaged with, our ecologists, our own team. We've got a, a team of agri and environment and ecological experts on board, and uh, we work out of South Kerry and, and uh, Mayo. Uh, we also work very closely with a team of farm advisors around the country, independent advisors that uh, work on the program with us and for us and for the farmers. And uh, we're also engaging a lot with managing authorities such as National Parks and Wildlife and um, the department and uh, Law Pro and, and other agencies. I suppose with the main idea of setting up this program in the first place or the requirement for it was in response to the environmental trends. I mean, freshwater permits itself, it's critically endangered. As um, Mark mentioned, it's one of 365 most endangered species on earth. Uh, and 80% of the national population, so of our population, 80% of it occurs in eight, eight populations. So um, that's 35% of the EU population. Uh, its overall status and trend, even despite uh, us having such a big population, is still declining and in bad conservation status. So it's critical that something be done to try and, uh, try and address it. And agriculture is just one of the pressures affecting the species. I mean, there's other pressures within these catchments, including forestry and, uh, and other um, land uses. So uh, general water quality, I mean, there's tenfold decline in pristine water since the late 80s. So it's, it's critical that something be done to try and address that, that issue and to improve things. Similarly, habitats in the Western upland areas, which is where we're working, they're also in very bad status and declining. So that's all of your peatlands, your grasslands, your upland habitats. So again, these are, the, these are the different trends that we're trying to reverse or try and address to some degree through our program. Um, and then climate change, of course, it's compounding many of the above issues. So just to give you a bit of background on the freshwater pearl mussel itself. It's an extremely complex life cycle. It uh, occurs in, in, in river environments. Um, it lives up to 140 years, each individual. So the adults, they live in the bed of the river. They just sit there. They don't attach to anything. They just sit in the bed of the river. If you're not familiar with them, they look no different to stones and you're looking in from a bridge or anything. But uh, they'd be filtering water away there all day long. Um, but uh, and the male and the female, they're two separates, and they reproduce uh, by um, the, the male releases sperm and the female takes it in and broods the, the, broods, um, the larvae. And they get released as larvae into the water column uh, at a certain time of the year, uh, July every year. And those larvae then are just released into a water column where they need to attach to the gills of a, a salmon or a trout in a short enough period. And they attach to the gills of the salmon or the trout where there's enough oxygen there for them to survive. They're just like very miniature little mussels and they're snapping like that. So they snap onto the gills of the salmon or trout and they live there for about a year before they eventually drop off. And when they drop off, they need to land an extremely clean sediment and uh, with enough oxygen again in the bed of the river for them to be able to survive. And this is the real critical stage, it's the juvenile stage where these juvenile mussels fall off the salmon and trout and they need to live in the sediment of the river. So they bury down a number of centimeters into the bed of the river and they live there for approximately five years. And it's during this period that the mussel is under most threat of um, declines in water quality or sediment. So if there's, if there's poor water quality or there's um, sediment coming into the river, it tends to clog up the sediment here and could lead to the death of the mussels at this stage. So it's for that five year period, it's critical that the health of the river is in good condition for them to survive, to, for them to survive and grow into the adults. And again, just live out the next 100 years uh, on the bed of the river as adult mussels. Um, as I said, it's eight catchments, 80% of the population. The main pressures, I suppose, arising from agriculture and that are the main pressures in general are flow, sediment, and nutrients. And flow is a really critical one here. It's um, in, in very drained catchments, you get very low flows in summer because the, the water is draining, draining off so quickly. And then very high flows in winter can lead to uh, sediment um, or erosion and that of the bed of the river and washing out of mussels. So the flow is a critical thing and that exacerbates the effect of two other pressures, which are sediment and nutrients. Obviously, if the, if the flow is heavy, you get higher, higher sediment inputs into the river. Uh, if their flows are very low, again, you get nutrients that are much more concentrated in the river during summertime. And also um, in low flow conditions, the, the river uh, is much smaller in extent. It goes into a much smaller channel and that can lead to pressures as well. Uh, so for the conservation of the species in Ireland, the, the priority really is to try and concentrate on these top eight catchments where there's still juvenile recruitment. 
There's very few juveniles occurring in other catchments in Ireland, but in these catchments, it's known that they're still recruiting, maybe not to good enough uh, degree to build sustainable populations, but they are there. So we feel the best efforts are to concentrate in these catchments and try and get improved things to make viable populations continue. Um, so these are the eight catchments, as I say, Glaskeelden and Donegal, down to Pondurah and Mayo, Davros and Owen Riff in Connemara, and then down to the Kerry catchments where Cara, Curran and Blackwater in South Kerry, and then Owen and Gopal in West Cork. So they're all very similar catchments, they're very peat dominated soils, um, extensive agriculture generally, mixed livestock, uh, sheep and cattle, and um, yeah, extremely heavy rainfall, I mean you're getting rainfall levels up above 2,000 2, mils a year. 3,000 in some instances. So they are the wet, some of the wettest parts of the country where, where we're working. Um, just in relation to the buy-in from farmers and the catchment coverage of the program. So we've, at the moment, we have 472 participating farmers. So that's over 80% of all of the herd numbers in the catchments. Uh, we incorporate both commonage and private land. Uh, the total participating land is equivalent to 25,000 hectares. So that's the amount of land that's it, that's participating in the program. Uh, we started off in year one with about 340 farmers. We've built up to 472. Um, so I suppose that the whole focus of this is that it's a results-based approach, that the payments that we're issuing each year are linked to the quality of the biodiversity. So the higher the nature value or the higher the biodiversity, the higher the payment level. So that's there obviously as an incentive and a reward to farmers who are producing good environmental outcomes or an incentive to, to produce better outcomes into the future. Um, it provides increased cost effectiveness. I mean, it makes loads of sense on all, all levels, but even from a taxpayer's point of view, at least you're paying for the results. So if you're not getting environmental outputs, well, you're not wasting your money on, on something that's not delivering. So I, I think it makes a, an awful lot of sense. Um, this gives you an idea here, the graph on the right, just each, each plot or each field on a farm is scored out of 10 using scorecards. And then obviously the score goes up, the payment level goes up. It's just the concept. Uh, it's all about creating an additional market. So, I mean, these are farmers obviously still producing food and they, they get, uh, they get a financial uh, reward for that but we're offering an alternative market. And in addition to their, their food, we are saying, well, let, let's produce environmental services and, and create a, a value on that. Uh, so what we're paying for, I suppose, is biodiversity, water and, and carbon. Um, and that, that's what we're, we're addressing. While our focus is on water quality, we also feel we're delivering for these things. Um, and that's based on the scorecards and the design of the program, that it, the results were result indicators we've chosen reflect improvements in, in these uh, environmental benefits. Um, I suppose the challenge posed by the aquatic species, which is really the... Um, the, the challenges we had when we were designing the program is that you have to choose a, an appropriate result indicator. And obviously water quality is a very difficult thing to, to measure in the first instance, but also to relate back to land use in a local area. So, and as well, of course, the farmers aren't necessarily farming in the rivers, they're farming the land. So it has to be within the farmer's control. And the result indicators have to obviously reflect uh, the quality of the, of the target. Um, but also um, they, they need to be within farmers' control. So we're assessing the, it's mostly terrestrial assessments, but it's obviously indicative of what's happening in the freshwater environment. Um, hydrological connectivity is a big challenge. We need to adapt a whole farm approach. We can't just, con just focus on particular areas of the farm because that whole farm is connected to the water courses in some way or another from the farmyard through to your most improved pastures down to the more extensive areas of the farm. So that, that's really what sets us apart from some of the other projects. Uh, we also need to, a, a catchment-based approach. So it's not just designated lands. Obviously any area of land within a river catchment contributes to water quality. So we have to consider everything within the catchment, not just the, the river itself and the bordering lands. Um, and I suppose the, the main thing is that we, we need to incentivize farmers to address problems and to improve low scoring lands and pressure points. So we're not just rewarding the best parts of the, the, the farm, we're actually looking at uh, improve the worst parts of it because that's giving rise to what the, what the issue is in the river. Uh, so these are the result indicators we, we settled on. It's uh, farm habitat quality. So we're looking at our grasslands, woodlands and peatlands. We've scorecard for each of the three of those. 
each year these are out going advisors working on our behalf go out or working on the farmer's behalf go out and assess these habitats on the farm score them from zero to ten the weighting on the scorecard is very much towards good um, hydrological status a good water water retention status and condition of the wetter habitats um, floodplain quality we also assess that each year so it's to, it's related to the scores on the on the plots and also the length of floodplain on an individual farm. Then we also look at the drainage and water courses. Obviously, we don't we don't ignore what's happening in the water courses. We need to see where there's pressures and threats on the water course, and we address those through a whole farm assessment. So we're looking at uh, where there's access by animals or evidence of erosion due to due to that or where's vehicle access even, or whether there's an absence of a buffer zone in improved lands would imply a, a risk of water quality. So we assess the risk and there's a correction factor on the farmer's payment based on that risk. If the risk is very low, they get their full payment. If there's very high risk or evidence of damage, the payment is, is reduced. Uh, and we also look at the farmyard and nutrient management to address those things. Uh, just just give you an idea of the peatland quality. Obviously, the one on the left is low quality. It's getting a low score, zero to four. We don't pay on, and that there obviously there's a lot of sheet erosion happening there. So it's a clear indication that that would be leading to low water quality. But obviously, the habitat itself is in poor quality, so that would not be getting a payment in, in our program. The middle one there is moderate quality, score of maybe four to six. There's a few little pinch points, but generally things are okay. We'd be issuing a payment to be low enough payment though, but then we're up to the scores of eight, nine, and 10 on the right-hand side. And that's where it's, it's the grazing level is, is appropriate for the type of habitat and it's in good condition and it's got all the positive indicators and that'll be scoring an eight out of 10 or a 10 and that's getting the highest payment. So that's getting the biggest reward. So that's the terrestrial habitats. We assess them all in relation to that. As regards the floodplain, it's just whether it's present or not. And if it is present, we issue a payment based on the quality of the habitat that, that floods. So if there's low quality habitat here and it's improved pasture and it's slightly slurry or whatever being spread on the land in these areas, that would be reflected in the score on those grasslands. And obviously we shouldn't, it's, it's not a very good thing that those lands flood. So there wouldn't be a play payment accruing. But where the habitat quality is good and indicates there's, there's not too much nutrients the sediment getting out on the, on the floodplain, well, then they get a higher payment and they get, get rewarded for that type of management to the floodplain. And then this is the whole farm assessment. As I said, we're looking at the condition of uh, water courses across the farm. If the water course is in really good condition, they get, this, uh, they get a whole farm assessment, anything from excellent down to poor. Excellent being where there's no pressure points, there's no indication of any damage, and there's no real risk of damage occurring. And that in that instance, their habitat payment, which is calculated initially, is given a bonus of 0.2. So we multiply the payment for the farmer by 1.2. So instead of a thousand euro, they get 1200 euro. However, if the opposite is true, and like down here in this photograph here, where there's a lot of sediment and damage apparent, and there's a high risk of, of water quality issues, then there's an inadequate scorecard or an inadequate score achieved, a 0.6 or even a 0.3 perhaps. And at that instance, the, the payment to the farmer is reduced by up to 40% or even 70% in severe instances. So this, is, uh, this means that you know, we're, we're not just paying on the terrestrial habitats. We have to relate to what's going on in the water course and what the risk is to water course. So um, that, that, that's how the correction works, that uh, it's very much targeted towards the the aquatic species, that if someone does have very high terrestrial habitats, well, we can't be issuing a very high payment if there's a risk to water quality. Um, the assessing the results, the assessments are done each year by approved advisors. We have upwards of uh, 60 uh, agricultural advisors approved to work on the program. They go through annual training and they go out and visit all the farms each year. And they're really the, the key between ourselves and the farmer. Um, and they are basically scoring the fields each year. They do the habitat quality assessment, as I mentioned, uh, at the field plot level. They record it using an app in the field on their mobile phone, um, and it's a score of zero to 10. So it determines the score. So it's all through an app that we developed through in the program, and this is submitted to us via that and appears in our mapping system where we get access to it pretty much straight away. Uh, they do the floodplain assessment, as I mentioned, it's going to have a, a presence or absence, they've already scored the fields within the floodplain. 
And then they do the whole farm assessment, which is another scorecard, which they uh, look at the risk of nutrients or sediment entering the watercourse and record that on, on that assessment. So I suppose it's just to reiterate the importance of advisors and the workload that they have. Like this is just a dashboard that shows what's been submitted this year by the advisors. And I mean, it, it's upwards of two and a half thousand scorecards or fields that have been scored by them this year. So it's a huge amount of work. And without, without their involvement and their hard work, I, I don't think the program would ever have got as far as we've got. Um, that's just an indication of the, of the different data coming into us. And it's great having this technology to be able to see the data coming in live and see what's outstanding. And if there's advisors under pressure, we can immediately identify it and try and help them out to try and get the scores into us. Um, just to go through the payment, the overall payment scheme. So I, I've mentioned all this before, but there's a results-based payment, which is based on the habitat quality and the floodplain payment. And then that's multiplied by the outcome of the water course assessment. So if it's poor, you only get 0.3 of this. If it's excellent, you get 1.2 times that, and it gets your final results-based payment in the year. Now, as well as that, we do have a supporting actions payment, which is available to farmers should they choose to avail of it. And this is where farmers can undertake actions to improve their score. So a, a low scoring farm in year one, obviously they're not getting great financial reward, but there's potential there for them to draw from another budget. But that money is only available to them if they're doing actions that are likely to increase to uh, lead to an increase in score. So it's very much targeted on appropriate measures in the right place. Um, so that's the supporting actions. Um, just to give you an illustration of how it might work for an individual farm, this, this farm here has, let's just say, five plots that are scored by the advisor. You can see there the highest scoring plot is down here, maybe species rich grassland scoring at 10, goes down to a score of zero on this plot here, which is obviously very improved and a lot of nutrients going onto that field and it's of low biodiversity value. So it, it's not getting a score, it's not getting a payment. And then you've got some moderate scores, a six, a six and an eight. You can see here there's patches of bare peat on the, on the hillside, on the peatland plot, so it's not achieving a very high score. So based on these scores, this farm, which is 50 hectares in extent, would get a habitat quality payment of 5,000 euro. But um, I'm sure you can all see the potential impacts here of water on water quality or the risk identified and the impacts identified. And that's down here where you've got the um, uh, feeding station and cows inside in the river and the drains are very much cleared and the sediment coming down into them. So that would have applied a poor whole farm result, which means that the farmer's payment is actually only 1500 euro. Despite him having all this lovely biodiversity, the payment is actually quite low, but that's because there's identified risks and damage to water courses. So, I mean, the, that's, in, that's in one year, but the key to it is that we identify those and the advisor then issues advice to the farmer so how the score could be improved and how we could address these pressures on the farms. And the farmer's incentive is that, well, you get a much higher payment if we address these, these concerns. So just by putting up the fence here, fencing up the water course, preventing the animals getting in, managing the drains differently, allowing them to revegetate somewhat, slowing the flow, maybe putting in some, some drain management measures, and also in installing a buffer zone along the, the field here just to prevent nutrients getting in. So by applying those measures, the farmer's payment in, in a year or two, I'd say probably certainly it would go most of the way within a year. It could go from 1,500 euro up to 6,000 euro. That's if it gets up to an excellent result, which obviously might not happen within a year, but maybe within two or three years, but certainly it should be getting up to a good result within a year. So getting from 1,500 up to 5,000. But the key thing is for us to make sure that the Advisors are equipped with the knowledge to be able to pass that message to the farmer and say, well, you, we could get an extra three or four thousand out of the program if you're to do these few actions on the, on the farm and try to get that whole farm result up to a good, good result. Um, just an idea of some or an example of some of the supporting actions we've, we are funding through the program. Uh, I mentioned at the start that flow and drainage is a big impact in, in these catchments on, on water quality. And obviously that also has an effect on biodiversity and, and carbon as well, particularly in peatland scenarios. So these are peat plugs. We've put in uh, peat dams into a, a former turbary plot up in Donegal. It's been a great success. The farmer there, again, we just went to him with the figures and said, well, look, you're, you're, you're currently getting this much. Uh, you could potentially get a lot more if you were to address the hydrological issues on the farm with the, the drains on the farm. And I mean, the, the benefit here is that once the farm is complete, he's happy, he's very happy with the outcome. I mean, it hasn't affected his ability to farm these areas. It's still grazed by sheep. 
And, you know, the, the benefit that he's seen himself from a farming perspective is that these little peat dams are actually now functioning as crossing points for the sheep to get from one area to another, which weren't there previously. So it's just a, a by the way. Um, there's timber weirs. It's just another measure where we've uh, looked at the farmers in Mayo. This is um, Colum Gavin, who's our Farming for Nature ambassador this year. He's been put forward. So if you're, you're looking to vote for anyone, I'd, I'd recommend Colum. But there's Colum putting in some timber weirs along a, a flush coming down off, uh, off an area of upland. And the pressure here was just in times of high flow, you do get a build up sediment and high flow rates coming down into the river via this, this flush that's been cleared out and uh, drained. So following putting this in, it slowed the flow, slowed the flow. You guess this is it. Within a year, it's revegetated. The slow is much more reduced. The water is seeping into the river, which is what really we want to do, rather than having flushes of, of water intensity into the river. So that's uh, another example of these measures that we co-fund to help the farmer improve their score. And obviously, from our point of view, gets a better environmental outcome. Um, another one here is just a crossing point. Again, we give the farmer the freedom to do it the way they want to do. As long as it achieves the result that we're looking for, we're happy enough for them to take their initiative. And obviously we have to approve it and make sure that they have an understanding of what, what they can and can't do. But this is where they've put in flags across the crossing point here next to the main river. And it's turned a pressure like this into this within a year again. So it, it's just an example of some of the things we're co-funding. This is uh, an in-ditch wetland, so this, this uh, field here on the right-hand side is draining down slope and is being picked up by this, kind of this uh, drainage ditch which runs along the bottom of the field. Uh, we identified this as a potential pressure point because the nutrients coming off the field, coming into that and coming straight into the river which runs along where the trees are there. So the idea of this is that you widen a small section of the drain, you put in a couple of uh, dams. Now the dams aren't actually up to the level of the field, so it won't affect the, the quality of the grass in the field as such, but it just allows water to, to slow before it gets into the main river and you get vegetation establishing here within a year or two, we'd hope. And that again, filters the water, takes out some of the nutrients and certainly settles out the sediment which stays inside in these little wetland um, chambers. Uh, needs very little maintenance throughout. Maybe eventually we'd have to take out the, some of the silt in the bottom and they can spread it on the land or whatever, but they, they take very little maintenance year to year. We've, we've yet to have to do anything on these ones. Uh, stock management is something as simple as this. It's a fence. It's actually a commonage area, so it wasn't that simple to get the fence, but we did help the farmers by going through the whole approval process with the department and on the appropriate assessment side of things with the local authority. Um, and following that, I mean, it, it's just a, pr a pressure point within a large area of commonage where the sheep were gathering the whole time and we just felt it needed to recover, needed a year or two rest. It's a temporary fence we've put in there, but again, we, we can see the recovery happening very, very quickly once that a change in stock management is, is implemented. Um, again, we'd have co-funded the fencing to go up here and we would have got a couple of the shareholders involved who were interested in doing the work, did the work, and obviously all the other shareholders might be up to, I don't know, 30 or 40 shareholders in this commonage, but they'd all get the benefit of the score going up during the year. So that's kind of how we got everyone's involvement and agreement for the work to proceed. Um, so that's it. I mentioned the advisors. I mean, we've, uh, we've, it's very much delivered by the, by the network of advisors. We're there to facilitate the advisors and the farmers working together. Uh, 61 advisors are trained. We do, uh, we support the advisors. We, we upskill them. We have annual training every year. We're at the end of the phone if they have any issues and need advice on stuff. Um, so it, it's working quite well. That's the side of the program and the advisors, as I say, are a key, key part to delivering the program. There's no way that we could have considered taking on so many farmers without having this network of advisors trained up and working on the program. Uh, farmer training, I think this is a very, very important aspect of these uh, results-based programs as well. It's, it really gives us to, a chance to get feedback from the farmers as to how they're finding the program. And like we, we'd love the idea that after, at the end of this program, the farmer would look at these fields and be able to almost score the field themselves and be familiar enough with the scorecards that they'd start thinking, okay, if I do this or that to that field, I get a higher score. So it's very much about that continuous engagement and learning between us and the farmers. And these training sessions are extremely beneficial. Um, I mean, there's just an interesting there. We did some feedback with them on Zoom calls during the year and 
I mean, 93% of them feel that their knowledge and value of appreciation of nature and the environment has increased since they came into the program. So I mean, that, that's, that's uh, encouraging from our point of view. Uh, and from day one, it was like, well, what's my score? What's it worth to me? What do I have to do? How can I increase it? All these questions keep coming up with these training sessions. So I think they're a great opportunity for us to be able to get our message with the farmers and similarly get farmers to give us feedback on how it's working for them. Uh, just an idea of some of the results from 2019 and 2020. 2021 scorecards have just come into our inbox and we're uh, working through those now over the next couple of months to try and get payments out to farmers for this year. But this is last year's uh, last year and the year before. You can see that the the scores generally from 2019. There's a few more scoring the higher higher scores. There's more moderate scores and there's a few less at lower scores. So, so obviously the farmers are changing something to get some of them up here. Not dramatic changes, and we wouldn't expect dramatic changes within a year or so, but. There is small changes there and overall there's more moving up into the higher categories than there would have been in the first year. Similarly, with the whole farm results, um, again, we're getting more of the good whole farm result here, some of them moving up from the um, from the inadequate 0 0.6s, so some of the farmers are benefiting there with their scores and their payments. Uh, just, I suppose, something that we, we like to kind of get out there is the value of the data we have. Like, it, it's we have um, the amount of information on the scorecard is amazing, and the how how that can be used for other purposes or for you know, environmental purposes is is very useful. And here we can just see the presence of rhododendron. This is just one question on the scorecard where you can show the distribution of rhododendron within the catchment based on the data that we're recording each year, or that the advisors are recording each year. Uh, this is all the red points indicate where rhododendron is present in this catchment. The green points indicate its absence. So straight away, if, if, if there's any regional programs or anything being set up that we can say, well, look, the lower part of the catchment is very much where we need to focus on, or the very upper part up here, or that this sub catchment up here seems to be free of rhododendron. So there, there's a lot of that kind of data, and particularly in relation to land drainage, we'd have a lot of data in the scorecards that would imply what areas are severely drained and what areas aren't throughout the wide catch, wider catchment. So I, I think there's a lot of value to be got from the data we're recording and, and not just to give an indication of the scores and the payments to the farmers. So that's it. I suppose one of the big questions for ourselves at the moment is where, where to next. Uh, we feel that this approach can be universally applied. I mean, I think the whole farm approach is a huge learning from our project and could be adapted and used in, in, in the wider like the environment sector. Uh, Wild Atlantic Nature Project, the Life IP project, uh, Derek McLaughlin, formerly working with us, is, is, is rolling out that program. And he's recruiting farmers throughout the West. And by the end of 2022, there'll be 1,300 par farmers participating in, in, in the Pearl Muscle Project, either through ourselves or through the um, Wild Atlantic Nature Life IP project, exact same setup they have. Uh, the new CAP, I think it, it presents an opportunity to expand and roll out this program and some of the other results-based programs. We're very much compatible with the Burren program and Hen Harrier EIP. We very much learned from them and kind of adapted what they've done before us. Uh, I think it's a demonstrable de delivery of climate, biodiversity, water quality benefits. So while our target is freshwater pearl mussel, I do firmly believe we're also delivery for the climate and biodiversity as well. Um, current programs to end in 2023. I think it's important whatever expansion and rollout should be initiated in the next year or two. And that uh, if, the, if, it, if we're being incorporated into the next capital, then um, I think the work on that needs to start sooner rather than later. Uh, I think the Power Muscle Project provides a tool to align multi, multiple policy objectives. And just to finish on, I mean, the, the landscapes you're working on are, are, are amazing. It's uh, the west of Ireland and the farmers there need, a, need, need that reward. I think they're delivering for biodiversity, carbon, uh, protection of soil, clean water. This is what all these landscapes are delivering. And this is why we're rewarding the farmers and feel they do need to be rewarded for managing and producing these, these public goods, flood management, aesthetic value of food, recreation, well-being. So I, I think it's just that, that that needs to be acknowledged that these farmers are managing this kind of a landscape. And producing these goods. Um, so that's it. Uh, thanks very much. I hope you found it of interest. There's our um, contact details and if you want any further information you can download it off our website. Thank you Patrick. I really enjoyed the presentation. Uh, particularly I love to see those before and after photographs. You know the, it's an amazing the, the impact. Was it just two years that that's um, that uh, commonage area was hard enough commonage area, but the lakeside area had been fenced yeah. off. 
Within about two years, that was. Um, looking forward to getting back up there soon now to see how things have changed since. That would have been springtime, I suppose, the latest time we would have been up there, yeah. It's, it's, it's incredible the, the impact that you've had so far, like even in such a short period of time. It was really 2019 before uh, you got out working with farmers. That's right, yeah. I mean, we had a lot of engagement with farmers for, during the first year, but it was very much a, a very intense year trying to design the whole program and that. And I suppose we, we might have, at the time, we would have loved another year to get ready, but we got it all up and running and to get out 350 farmers within a year of, of of setting up an office I think was a good enough achievement in itself so yeah this is the third year of the program so um, we're expanding the whole time and as I said there's two more years to run before we finish up. And what, what level of engagement have you had with farmers and landowners along I was just looking at the the, the map of rhododendrons and just try, you know obviously you can't get 100% of, of participation how, how has that been working? Um, it's been very high since day one it was very positive um the advisors were key to that as well you know we had them involved from the very start and just them having the existing relationship with the farmer was important that they're the first person a farmer is going to go to when they hear of a new scheme should i or shouldn't i get involved so it was a lot of there was a lot of talking with farmer groups and farmers and advisors through the first year and i mean we pretty much I, I don't know if there's much chance of getting the remaining 15%. There's many reasons some farmers don't want to join these kind of programs. Um, so I think we're very close to maximum participation with the 83% of the farmers in each of the catchments. Yeah. That's excellent. Uh, in terms of, um, we look at a lot of these uh, schemes and programs, they, they have a defined period. Um, and have you given any consideration to, to after the project or or, or, you know, where, where to after the project? I know you spoke about next, next steps, but uh, would you see that this being incorporated into a wider scheme or would you prefer to see more bespoke uh, schemes for, for uh, specific uh, target species like this? I, I think um, the Parmaster project itself, I think, is perfectly designed for, for these kind of catchments. And it wouldn't necessarily need to be a Parmaster catchment, but any of the West of Ireland peatland catchments, I think it, it could be rolled out as it is almost. And that's what the Wild Atlantic Nature guys are doing. They're rolling it out across a load of um, blanket bog catchments in the West and the Northwest, so far beyond where we're working at the moment. Um, into the future, I mean, I suppose we were set up and the reason we were in the previous RDP or set up in the first place was to test and trial something like this to see if a results based program could be upscaled and I think we've shown that it can be by a small enough team and we would hope that maybe the department through their resources will be able to bring it to the next level and get a much higher participation. There's no reason you couldn't get 10,000 farmers in something like this if the, if the will was there to do it. Um, and I, I think with small tweaks, it could be expanded throughout different types of, types of landscape. And yeah, um, so that, that's where I'd like to see it go. Yeah, for sure. Um, I know that there is proposals for cooperation projects in the next uh, or in the next cap. So hopefully it'll fit in somewhere there, or at least the learnings will be taken on board through that. Uh, some questions in we have a great attendance here of uh, advisors, foresters, SASIP advisors, uh, people from policy, we have researchers, huge array of, of, uh, of uh, viewers this morning. Uh, so welcome to everybody. But just specifically around the in involvement of advisors, people asking how, how would advisors paid for the services and, and who pays for this? Just on news there, Patrick. Myself, sorry. Um, yeah, the advisors are are paid by the farmers, so the, uh, it comes out of the farmer's payment. So our payment rates uh, are calculated on the basis that there's probably twenty percent administration fee uh, in there in, in, built into the payment. So the farmer pays the advisor out of the payment that we issue them. We assume it comes out of that money. Um, in the Case of commonages, we kind of agree a payment rate for a commonage area and we facilitate the payment. So the advisor doesn't need to invoice all the individual shareholders. We pass the payment onto the um, onto the advisor and deduct it from the farmer's payment ourselves. But it's generally a very small amount when it's divided up amongst all the farmers. So that, that works well enough as well. Okay. And going back to my 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 other question there, the, the, the question. There's a question here about how long will the payments to farmers continue and is there an expectation that the improvements achieved will be maintained if payments finish? 
it's a, I think that's quite a good question because I know there was an issue there. I know where, where farmers were in, involved in the REPS program. And as the years went by, it, it, it was argued that maybe there were less actual um, maybe capital expenditure works or uh, works on the farm to be done. Um, where, where, where do you see that headed? Yeah, I think that's the great thing about the results-based programs is that there's a sustainable payment there for the farmer and obviously it's subject to the results-based scheme continuing, but it's not based on having to do capital works every year, which surely at some stage you have enough fencing done that you don't need to do any more fencing. So I think there's a, a sustainable payment payment means there by issuing the results-based payment. And um, yeah, I, I, I don't know. I mean, we, we'd obviously hope that something like this would continue and the the mutings we're getting from the department and even from the EU side of things is that this is the way forward and the results-based payments are here to stay. But it's the first thing the farmers asked us five years ago when they came into it, well, how do we know what's gonna happen at the end of it? And you know, farmers are slow to make that big jump to do capital works without knowing that it'll be a long-term benefit as any of us would be. It's an investment on their point, on their part. And particularly when we're asking them to look at the drainage of their peatlands and they're saying, oh, should the next crowd coming through might ask us to do something else. So, you know, that, that's a real difficulty and a challenge. So it'd be great to have some certainty there for the farmer and for everyone to know that this is the way it's going to be going and the way it's going to be continuing. But I think with the climate action plan and everything, it has to go this way. And I think it probably is going to be the way to be going. But again, we, we can't promise it. No, I agree. I think that the longevity needs to, we need to try and uh, have that have that certainty there for, for participants. Um, as for as yeah. long as possible. Had some uh, a lot yeah. of questions coming in actually. Yeah, yeah there are. Uh, and then there's a good deal around, uh, I suppose, two areas. Uh, what are the criteria uh, for success from the point of view of conservation and increasing the breeding population, the, the, the pearl mussel? And I suppose the related question coming in from a lot of people is have you seen any uh, early? indications of, of improvement in the pearl mussel population or in, in the conditions associated with success of, of the, the potential to, to uh, uh, breed? Um, yeah, great question. I suppose that the difficulty with something like pearl mussel, when you've got such a long-lived species, it might be a long time before we actually see the results of this, and there's bound to be a lag time before it, it kicks in. And then the other difficulty, of course, is there's other land use pressures within the catchments that need to be addressed at the same time. But uh, there, the actual monitoring of pearl mussel populations is done by National Parks and Wildlife Service, and that's on a rolling basis every number of years. Now, I think they've had preliminary good results down in, um, in the Kerry catchments after the project that preceded us, Kerry Life. So those results are kind of coming in now, and it shows that things have improved somewhat. So early indications are good, but as I say, it's, it's, it's a long-term rolling thing, and it's related to what Mark says, you know, it, these things when you're dealing with long-lead species, it has to be, it might be 10 to 15 years before, before we see the benefits on the mussels, but even the improved results at the farm level, the knock-on from that is there's got to be an improvement further down the catchment and overall in the catchment on account of farming. A, a couple of questions again around, uh, okay, the, the pearl mussel is an indicator species of pristine water quality, but is there any, uh, or can we, uh, transplant the, the uh, transfer to other locations if the uh, baseline uh, uh, water quality improved. In other words, areas that may have had populations in the past, is there is there any prospect of, of doing that if we could get the water quality right to take them? Um, yeah, interesting question. I, I think there's a lot of relics populations in the country that still sustain the adults. So when the adult mussels are there, they can withstand much more pressure than the juveniles. So I suppose they're non-reproducing populations. So I suppose they'd be the next ones you'd kind of focus in on. And if the conditions in the river are right, well, they should naturally maybe come back because they do re have the potential to reproduce into old age. But it, it takes a, it takes an awful lot for those rivers to recover to such a degree because there's so much silt and sediment after coming down that it's locked into the substrate and it's the substrate quality, not just the water quality that you need improvements on. So it, it's, it's a major amount of work to do that. Um, I think translocating mussels from one river to a river where they're gone completely from is probably further down the line. I think the priority would be to try and maybe, first of all, safeguard the ones where we have recruiting populations like our ones, and then look at those where there's relic populations of adults and try to get the habitat conditions right for them to either 
uh, sustainably or naturally rep reproduce again uh, will probably be the next best approach. Okay, a question there. Uh, you mentioned that the Carry Life program, uh, and I suppose it, you, you talked about a degree of continuation. What were the learnings there and the key learnings that have uh, progressed from one uh, program to another? And, and what are the, I suppose, the particularly new elements in, in, in the Paramuscle project? Um, yeah, I suppose our, our big, um, the, the big learnings that we got from them, I suppose, was the, the knowledge of the catchments where we started working in. And they would have done a lot of research on the water quality and that side of things and also the individual measures. So they were more kind of testing measures and the ability of measures to improve things. So they would have done a lot of um, alternative drinking locations, fencing, all that kind of stuff and looking at the efficacy of that and the success of that and different ways of doing it. So we would have brought that in and that they're the capital works that we co-fund now those measures and uh, different ways of managing water coming off farms. So th that's very much the learnings we would have got from them. Now we would have a much, we would have taken what they did and they did an element of um, results-based, but we just brought it to another level with results-based side of things. And very much maybe we do have measures as actions that farmers can do, but that's secondary to the actual results-based payment, which is our, our main payment. Whereas the uh, Kerry Life was more focused on the actions and getting them right. But so I think it's been a good um, transfer. And of course, they did all the footwork of getting the farmers engaged and, and involved in the first day that uh, when we came in, we were pushing an open door with a lot of the farmers in South Kerry because they had already worked with the guys in Kerry Life for five years. Right. Uh, a question there in relation to, I suppose, that the, they're saying the purpose of the EIPs was to, to learn with a view to uh, uh, mainstreaming uh, uh, some measures into future agri-environmental and climate schemes. Uh, to what extent have you been engaged with the Department of Agriculture uh, uh, in relation to the formulation of the CAP strategic plan? Uh, um, I suppose that there's, there's been good engagement over the last year or so. We've had a lot of meetings with them. I suppose I'm, I'm part of this um, Farming for Nature technical group that we've put forward a submission on how we could see these results-based programs being incorporated into the next cap. So uh, we, we've been, it's been mixed, I suppose, at times. It's been frustrating that we were kind of wondering if, if, if their learnings are ever actually going to be incorporated. But in fairness, we've we had very intense meetings with them most of this year. But I think the pressure is on to really move to the next level and, and try and nail it down as to what, what shape it's going to take. But certainly in the last year, we've had a lot of engagement and in fairness to the department, they have been taking our learnings on board from what we can see. And there's a question in relation to the nature of the, the or a couple of questions about the nature of the payment. That at the moment, it, it's a top, if I'm right, it's a, it's a top up payment. Uh, over and above any involvement in agri environmental schemes. So there's a question there, is there any issues with double payments? And going forward, uh, the, is this the, the model of, of where uh, uh, high intensity uh, uh, results based schemes need to be top up or should they be fully incorporated? Um, I think they should, like, the the bar is set so high in these areas of high nature value farmland that I think that it's right that the farmers should expect to get a, a certain level, but then have the ability to earn more if they so wish and the ability to achieve more because we're asking them to deliver more in these areas. So I do think it's important that the results base be on top of what the baseline payments are. Um, uh, at the moment, there's no real risk of double payment and that we would have assessed the potential for, for that to arise through TAMs and stuff. So a lot of our actions that we're funding, we have to make sure that they're not double funded already through TAMs and, and that those kind of checks are done. But also GLOSS was considered as a potential for double payment. And we came to the conclusion that probably there might be a 40% overlap between our grassland scorecard and GLOSS. So the payments on LIP parcels, for example, that are for low input permanent pasture, those parcels can only receive 60% of our payment because they're already paid under glass for, for that, a similar measure. So that, that's how that's addressed, yeah. There is an interaction between the, the schemes. It's useful. Uh, um, uh, we had a question here. Um, why is it called pearl muscle? Very simple question. Um, and I, I know it, it, it might sound obvious, but I know that there is another threat to pearl muscles as well. Uh, in terms of, of poaching. It, 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 am I right in that, Patrick? Yes. So uh, uh, the, the reason they're called freshwater pearl mussels is that they, they do, um, one in a thousand maybe might have a small pearl in them. 
they're not exactly a perfectly round pearl, but some clump of a kind of a pearl and they do form. So they would have been harvested in the past for that purpose. Uh, but I mean, it's illegal to, to take them or injure them or take them from a river at this stage. Uh, I think poaching is largely no longer a, a threat or a pressure. Thank goodness. But um, yeah, that's it. They, they do form pearls with, within them or within a, a small proportion of them. And to what degree uh, has there been engagement outside of the, let's say, the farming, direct farming community, Patrick, um, you know, with the wider, the wider community around this project? Because I know you did say that it, it is more than just farming that, that's uh, adding to the pressures on, on these uh, creatures. Yeah, I suppose our, our key thing is with the farmers and engaging with them and through our training courses and stuff like that. Uh, but we also do school events and that kind of thing. So we do go out to the local schools and and uh, we give presentations to them every now and again and do colouring competitions and that kind of thing. So I think that's a, a big thing that we do locally in each of the catchments. Um, beyond that, uh, the, I suppose these are real farming communities. So when you're with the farmers, you're pretty much embedded in the community at that stage. Uh, we do have aspirations to run a, they have a Pearl Muscle Cup down in Kerry between the catchments where they have an under 10 football competition every year. So unfortunately with COVID, we've had to give that up. We'd hope to maybe reinstate that next year. It's one of the first things the farmers asked us before they'd sign up, will you continue with the Pearl Muscle Cup? So that, that's just something by the way. But uh, I suppose the other stakeholders, obviously a forestry and um, and the likes of that and they'd be sitting on our steering group and we'd be engaging with them a bit but we're certainly trying to focus in on the farming and the farmers and you know i do think it's important that there be an umbrella there to bring all, all the stakeholders together because it isn't only farming that's the big pressure in these areas there's other other activities turbury as well as another one that's kind of somewhat unregulated what sort of measures, uh, because there are measures I know that within the forestry regulations that they have to adhere to to try and reduce sedimentation and so forth. It, it, yeah. is, that, is that having an effect? Um, it, it is, I'd say. I, I wouldn't be fully abreast of where they're at at the moment, but certainly they've they've quite hard, a high bar to reach now to ensure that there's no silt and sediment coming off stream felling and replanting and stuff. But um, I, I know they have their own difficulties in these catchments to be able to to pursue the the forestry without having effects on pearl mussel which is critically endangered yeah question there in relation to the uh when you're looking at a, a farm assessment are you paying as uh, more attention to the closer you get to the river or is it a, a, a basically looking at the total the, the farm in its totality and treating it all in a similar way it's very much treating it all in a similar way but some of the questions are very much related to how the interaction of the plot is with the water course. So is there a buffer zone present? Um, is, there, is there runoff coming from this field into a main river channel or not? But, uh, and certainly the, I suppose, we, it's, it's all assessed the whole way and we, we treat every parcel of land the same, but there is a top up payment for farmers that have exceptionally important land along the main river. So that's the floodplain payment. So in, in that instance, I suppose we are, kind of, we are rewarding more as you get closer to the main rivers. Uh, the question there is, is, uh, a, 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 I suppose, a catchment payment for all farmers in an area possible if this is to be scaled up or to what you're looking at, I suppose, uh, uh, moving to a, a broader level of uh, uh, susceptible or, or high nature value uh, uh, habitats? Yeah, I, I think that that's a very interesting concept. We've, we've, we've been looking at it as an idea to pursue in our program to trial. It would be a kind of a bonus payment maybe for farmers within subcatchments where there's where there's notable improvements in water quality that each farmer who has land in that catchment might be able, uh, get into a bonus if there's an improvement in water quality. The difficulty arises in measuring it and uh, kind of differentiating it from other potential sources within the catchments but it's something we'd aspire to and I think it'd be very good if there was some kind of a, a landscape type payment or a, a sub catchment based payment if we could relate it to achievements and to get collective kind of buy-in from the farmers in the catchments. An early question that we had was what were the criteria used in picking the, the age uh, catchments? Uh, it's basically the, the top eight catchments. So the National Parks and Wildlife Service would have been monitoring the pearl mussel populations throughout the country. And these catchments we regarded as the, the most important and the ones with best juvenile recruitment. So they're the ones that 
show the best signs of being able to re be recoverable. Uh, so that that was the criteria, as I understand it. They picked the, the eight top uh, catchments. There's 21 catchments in the country that have been designated for pearl mussel, but these eight are the highest achievers. I imagine if one was to upscale this to other catchments, the next ones to be included would be those in the 21 um, catchments that are designated. Okay. Uh, a question there in relation to who is funding the, 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 the payments and to what extent is there a possibility of getting private sector involvement in, in uh, projects like this? Um, yeah, I, uh, at the moment it's Department of Ag uh, through the European Innovation Partnership, so it's the RDP, uh, is, is funding it in its entirety. Um, I think the potential involvement of private money is, is interesting um, as to how that would work for the model. Of of making it work, I, I'm not I'm not sure how it could. Um, I mean, a, a nice idea would be to have to look at the branding side of things. That if we feel that these that if if the consumers look at the products coming from these areas where they know that the farmers are delivering something like this, that maybe the results based could be reflected on the branding side of things. So the higher the result, the higher the price the farmer gets for their produce might be a way of getting additional funding into it. There's a question there in relation to the opportunity for farmers to feed back their knowledge and experience through through the process. Does does that happen, uh, and has it led to any any improvements in the in in, in the process? Um, well, there is definitely feedback coming from them. We we do have meetings at the end of the year, and our catchment officers are out meeting farmers nearly every day, and that there is a lot of feedback. And we did we have uh, addressed any potential issues of concern to them at, at different stages. Uh, we weren't willing to get rid of our whole farm assessment myself as I would have wanted because that would have just completely turned the whole objective of what we're doing on its head. But no, certainly there, there's been a lot of feedback from them and we've had, we've had very good feedback and we do incorporate it into our own learnings. We might we finish off with a heresy of a question. <laughs> Can you eat the muscle? <laughs> <laughs> Not if you want to survive, I'd say. Uh, I doubt they'd be very tasty, so I wouldn't try them. No. <laughs> not, the, not the objective of this project, Pat. <laughs> no, I, I don't think they'd do you any good if they're sitting in the river for 100 years as you're there accumulating some nasty stuff. Okay, look, we better leave it there. We're just up on half past 10. Uh, Patrick, thank you so much for coming along today and, and sharing with us all, all of the excellent work that's going on in the project and uh, really congratulations to you and all of the farmers that are involved. I think it's a, it's a superb example of a results-based scheme and uh, I think lots of learnings coming from it for further future schemes and, and EIPs as well. So if people want to find out more about the project, pearlmuscleproject.ie, is that correct, Patrick? Um, that's right, yeah. Um, so it's a, it's a good, really good website, very informative about the life cycle and the... the uh, yeah, we have a lot of video resources and that up there if people are interested in that from, from last year, we would have put a lot of our, our stuff online and even the demonstration of the apps and the technology is up there because I think that's something that can be really brought on as well to another level after these projects. Great, great. Well, uh, thank you again. And uh, just to let people know that we're, we, next week we'll be joined by Ian Short, uh, Forestry Research Officer with Chagas, along with Jim McAdam, Queen's University, and Eugene Curran from uh, the Department of Agriculture, will all be speaking about agroforestry and the multiple benefits for Irish agriculture. So look forward to, to being joined by uh, Ian and his colleagues. Um, just a final word to say thanks to our production team, Andy Boland, uh, Pat Murphy, and Yvonne Maher. And uh, we look forward to seeing you again next week at 9.30. And a reminder, if you do want to listen in or if you know of anybody who's maybe doesn't have time to listen in uh, and view the webinar you can tune in to the signpost uh, podcast and uh, listen to it in, in the car or the tractor or wherever you might be it's a, it's a good way to catch up on the series so with that we say thanks very much and we'll see you again next uh, next friday at 9 30. you've been listening to the podcast version of the chagas signpost series the weekly webinar that promotes and examines sustainability in Irish farming. Don't forget to join us live every Friday morning for our latest webinar. For more, visit chagas.ie. And you can also rate, review and subscribe to the Signpost series on Apple Podcasts, Spotify or wherever you get your podcasts from. I'm Mark Gibson and thanks for listening.